In this episode, we discuss what is the essence of the Anabaptist vision. So I'm here with Chester Weaver, and Chester is a board member of Anabaptist Perspectives and also a school teacher for the last 37 years. And uh, you're here from Texas. It's wonderful to um, be discussing what is the foundation pieces of the Anabaptist worldview, its theology, and and how we got here for over the last 500 years, which is, uh, th there's no way we can cover everything. But in this particular episode, we want to discuss what is the essence of, of the Anabaptist vision? Where did this start? Uh, and why does it matter to us today? Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I would like to go to this slide. Thomas Aquinas said around 1100 AD, no one can live without delight. And that is why a man deprived of spiritual joy goes over to carnal pleasures. Now, it's worth parking and thinking about that for a while. But the Anabaptist vision understood that there is no real joy as long as dualism is present. Hypocrisy is not a pleasant experience. It's a miserable experience. But whenever you learn how to put the broken pieces together and be healed into integrity and oneness. There is a delight there and joy that is overwhelming. And people, once they get that, really aren't interested in going over to carnal pleasures. But if a person has not been healed like that, they tend to gravitate toward carnal pleasures because God has designed the way we're humanly made to be only joyful when we are healed. We can have superficial joy. We can have superficial pleasures, but it's all hollow until we are really healed from our dualism. And Anabaptism is all about that, that healing. Here is the essence of the Anabaptist vision. It's, it's in four statements. Uh, the very first statement is <clears throat> assumed. Harold Bender in his uh, Anabaptist vision referred to numbers two, three, and four. But number one is assumed. Jesus Christ, through the Holy Scriptures, is the ultimate authority. Everything hinges on that one. And number two, since he is, I order my life and discipleship to him, which means in my healed, I am healing and sanctification. I, I increase my joy as I find my healing in him. Number three, when others do the same, I enter into a body relationship with them called the church. If you are being healed and you are joyful and your spirit I delight to be a part of you. And number four, the church, unique from its host culture, supernaturally demonstrates the love of Christ as it cooperates with him to build his kingdom in the world today. So if you are also being healed and full of joy, I delight to cooperate with you in Christ's kingdom to do extension work, build his kingdom in the world today. Invite brokenness to be healed. Those four statements are just loaded with meaning. But if you had to distill everything down into the essence, this is what I would understand it to be. How have these basic concepts of the Anabaptist vision impacted the way Christianity has been understood by the Anabaptist people through the centuries uh, since this whole movement started? Okay, first of all, it has been misunderstood. Hmm. It has invited so much persecution because it had disturbed the order the dualistic order was the way the world is supposed to be. And when Anabaptism began to address this dualism, many people interpreted it as anarchy. And the first reason we were killed is because we were anarchists. We were trying to separate the state church. Okay, so, so clarify that a bit for me. So when you're saying dualist, this whole concept of, of separating certain parts of, of, of the world and the Anabaptists saying, no, it's all one integrated whole, and when they did that, the world interpreted it as anarchy okay, or, so or the government, I guess? Fabric is made of warp and woof. Okay. Okay, so they understood that state and church. And you have to have the two together. Just like if you pull the warp apart from the woof, it's like fabric, f threads torn apart. There's no fabric anymore. Society cannot stay together unless you have state church together. Okay. And we were attacking that. We we're saying that sh the state has uh. no... St uh, no uh, authority in the church. Jesus Christ is the authority in the church. So the Anabaptists were coming into that kind of society that existed at that, at that point in That's Europe. Right. 
and saying, this isn't correct. Jesus is Lord of the church. Exactly. And that caused the society then to say, well, you, you're destroying right. what, what holds everything together, right. basically. Exactly. Then away from there, uh, once governments realized that uh, this is not okay to keep killing people, uh, they took the next step up from that and harassed us. They tolerated us in certain places. Hmm. But especially in Switzerland, they keep putting pressure on us to get out. And this would have been at what point in, in history? In the 1600s. First 1600s. of all, okay. in the first, uh, we'll say, 30 years from, I think the last martyr in Holland was like 1574, but the last one in Switzerland was 1614 with Hans Landis. Hmm. They cut his head off, 70-year-old man, but it so disturbed the local people. That's the last execution in Europe. But they still wanted to get rid of us. It was no longer politically correct to kill us, so they put pressure on us. And there's a whole story on that. But uh, they, they pushed us, and, and as we got squeezed out, we went to the Palatinate. We just went up the Rhine River to the Palatinate. And that's where we met William Penn, who invited these persecuted people to the United States, to his colony, which is being created for persecuted people. It was called a holy experiment. People didn't think it was possible. See, there was a state church of Puritans in New England, and they were actually persecuting people who didn't conform. There was a state church in Virginia, the Anglican church. They didn't persecute people. It was still state church. And Maryland was in between. It was a Catholic colony. Of course, that's state church. But Pennsylvania? This is weird. The holy experiment. You mean you're going to let people do whatever they want to do? William Penn said, yes. Okay, we'll see. And lo and behold, it worked. It worked so well that eventually the freedom, the, the first uh, four amendments, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, and freedom of religion were built into the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. That's so interesting because, okay, so before that, it, it, you had this old world, I guess, style of, yes. of how this was all state, church, whatever. And if you stepped out of that system, it was like you didn't have a place in society. Perfect. So that is why the Anabaptists were viewed as, well, you don't you don't fit in because you're these weird radicals that are following right. Jesus and you're not conforming to what the government wants you to be, basically. Right. Is, is that That's a right. correct way? Roger Williams up there in Puritanism, he came up with some of the same concept too, but he just had a little tiny spot. Hmm. Whereas Pennsylvania was a big experiment. What's well, interesting now, whenever history is written, we read today, we read more about Roger Williams than we read about what happened in Pennsylvania. So we were talking about how church and society and these things functioned in history. Um, some people look at the two kingdom idea, the two kingdom concept that we talk about as Anabaptists, as meaning the two kingdoms being the realm of the church and the realm of the state. How did the early Anabaptists or how do the Anabaptists view it? So if we look at this essence here, if Jesus Christ, the Holy Scriptures, is the ultimate authority, he's our king. And the people who order their lives in discipleship to him are members of that kingdom. And people who don't do that are not a part of that kingdom. And so the church, in number three right here, the body relationship, is like Christ showcased to the world, this is how all of society would be if people would live in my kingdom. Oh, it's it's like Dean Taylor says, I think in, I don't know, maybe one of our episodes or somewhere, we are to be what is to become, yeah. something like yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah. And we call that the church. And uh, so the church is just simply has a distinct law, set of laws, a distinct ideal, a distinct relationship with God that is threatening to society when we are doing our work properly. When we're cooperating properly with Christ in all this healing and wholeness, we are a threat to people who are not like that. Because they sense, whenever righteousness comes in contact with unrighteousness, it senses it's scared. And it wants to get a do away with this godly stuff. It's, it's, it's scary. But we don't apologize. It's just like, we do our best to live in uh, submission and a loving relationship to our king. Jesus Christ. And we find his directions in our constitution, especially the Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament. This is the ideal. When we follow through with these four principles, this is to be experienced by every Anabaptist church member. 
It's the B Trinity. We believe God's great truths, which means we get in touch with reality, which means we agree that we're going to be healed. We're going to be made whole from our dualism. To do that, we are transformed within. It's the being part of this, experiencing a new reality within, which creates this joy that we talked about in the first slide there. It's like, we don't, we're not interested in carnality anymore. We have something bigger, better, and more blessed. And so the third B is behaving, transformed without. In other words, the uh, principle turns into practice that matches, and we have a new reality in daily life. I get a chance to love you. I got a chance to serve you. I get a chance to make a difference in the world. And that's delightful. It's like, it's the ideal. It's a dream come true. That's the ideal. Now, does everybody uh, deal, uh, live into that ideal? I, I've got to be honest. This is the job of history, just to tell the story. Okay, so we could ask, why does history illustrate so much Anabaptist failure in the past 500 years? What was wrong? Why couldn't we live into that ideal? Well, Stephen Dintman actually came up with this spiritual poverty of the Anabaptist vision. The Anabaptist vision that I just gave you assumes two things. It assumes this, the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit in the inner transformation of a person. I just talked about that. That's one part of the ideal. It also assumes that discipleship is only meaningful and possible because it's an answer to who God is and what he's doing in the world. It assumes that. But if we fail to emphasize those two, and we only look at the mechanics of the vision, here are three consequences. Okay, so we're going to be honest about this. We have, don't have a perfect record because we have assumed too much. Number one, the vision gave us little insight into human behavior. In other words, the ideal was up here, but we didn't know enough of how to translate that into people with problems. Maybe I have problems. So you could either go on with your life and make your money, or you could love me, take some time with me, and help me be healed. We didn't emphasize that second part enough. We have situations today that are embarrassing because we've not done our homework. And I don't know if it's really profitable to illustrate all that here in this context. So that's the first failure. The second failure is we were left an inadequate awareness of the liberating work of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, we didn't put the theology into practice as well as we should have. There's still a little dualism there, and it's that dualism that works itself out in human misery. We can't have joy as long as the wholeness isn't present. And thirdly, we've been impoverished in our sense of the spiritual presence and power of the living Christ. In other words, we've become mechanical. We've been focused on the performance, the outer, as what we see at the expense of what it takes to be genuine completely, bringing the healed parts together. Is that, is that basically legalism? Kind is that what you're saying? Yes, or, yes, or, um, yes, that's true. Or maybe a mis misemphasis, yes. perhaps. So I confess that uh, this is the downside or the flat spots of Anabaptism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that was one of the questions I had. You, you laid out these four main pieces of, of the essence of Anabaptist belief and how have we done through the centuries, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and there's, I mean, assuming it's kind of a ebb and flow and up and down, like certain eras have been better than others, mm -hmm. perhaps. Okay, so the most power we've had spiritually is in our beginnings. Again, this is embarrassing. These ideals are so high and so fragile that it's so easy not to reproduce them. And that goes back to our subtitle, can we reproduce this through the generations? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said earlier, there's been enough of this that it has actually come down somewhat to the present. And it's that little that we can fan back into flame. And so in this country, the very beginnings of this country, uh, there were some worthy things, but we got loved. We got to be involved with money and we found out in freedom, you can actually vote. We were always subjects in Europe. When we came to Pennsylvania, we were citizens. You mean we can vote and control our own future? And so we did. We kept the Quakers in, in office for a while. until we got, This would have been like early 1700s-ish? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
So it's almost, it sounds like you're describing fragmentation, perhaps? Partly. Or it's more than that, but it was Like a lack like, of teaching, maybe? There's uh, a big one. See, okay. by coming across the water, we left our German resources and came over into an English environment. And okay. we didn't have our resources. You mean, when you say resources, you mean like, uh, like books by, and, yeah. and, okay, the history even, perhaps? Yeah. Some of that well, was lost. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing that was a bright spot early on before the French and Indian War, the Germans in Pennsylvania asked Peter Miller at the Ephraim Cloisters to translate Martyr's Mirror into German from Dutch. Hmm. So they did that. Okay, so that was an evidence that there was some kind of life and power present. There's a book that's very interesting to see, to get a picture of what's going on in this period. If you read the Twas Seeding Time by John L. Ruth, it tells the story of the, the pluses and minuses, the successes and the failures of this in early Pennsylvania. And then we went into the Civil War and Reagan, it's just embarrassing, by failing to teach and to keep these concepts that we're talking about, we lost untold numbers of people because we started moving west. The, the idea was, go west, young man. Your future's in the west. Go make money. Mm -hmm. And John, L. Funk, John F. Funk noticed this, and he wrote in A Herald of Truth, don't do that. Make sure you go to a church in the west. Don't just go out in the west. Oh, yeah. Okay. You lose yourself. You got to go to church somewhere. And so many of our people went to the local Presbyterian, the local Baptist, or whatever. And their children married there, and we lost untold numbers of people as a result of that. So again, it's it's this idea of fragmentation, really, right? And it just kind of scattered, and a lot of the essence we didn't have was the lost. Vision. Yeah, that's right. We didn't have our vision with us anymore. Well, we should uh, we should do an episode on that era of history, the Civil War era, and, and so forth. There's a lot there that I that I don't know, and I. Anyway, we'll, maybe we'll unpack that another time. I don't want to go off into the in the weeds, but that's. It's an important part of the story. Yes, and I, I just wish we would have more uh, uh, that in the back of our minds whenever we're moving forward into history because we don't need to keep making mistakes. We don't need to keep trying to reinvent the wheel. It's, you know, it's already there for us. May I take some time now to go down through and unpack this? Yes, please. Okay, so 500 years of wear. So we've been working at this vision for 500 years. What's the story? It's just amazing that we're even here. It's amazing we're even doing this interview because it tells us that there's something that's been retained through all these years. Okay, so let's just go down through this. Later generations of Anabaptists have been handed a watered-down version of the faith of their forefathers. This spiritual loss has come about because of several factors. Okay, over in Europe, number one, persecution fatigue. Did you know my people, which I come from Zurich, and your people... I think you came 150 years later. That's a different story. But my people were already getting tired of being persecuted. And so we told each other, oh, let them put a little water on our babies. It's not baptism. It just, it just saves us persecution. Because our children, because they're not being baptized, they couldn't have legitimate marriages. Their children were illegitimate. I mean, they had no future. Oh, because this comes back to what we were talking about earlier, where the Society and the church were so integrated, you, you had to have both, basically. Exactly. exactly. And when you step out of that, again, you don't fit in anymore. Yeah. And so, yeah. how do you cope with that? Yeah. And wow. well, we get tired of it. And so, we start to make compromises until your people came along and told us that's a compromise. You're, you're not being faithful to the Anabaptist vision. Well, that kind of compromise is called Nicodemism among my people. Number two, the economic opportunity in America and the result materialism experience. Okay, so once we were pressured in Europe to go out, we also were invited to America. So it's a push and a pull, a push out of pure Europe, but a pull to America. It was unheard of. In Pennsylvania, you could actually own your own land and hundreds of acres of it. And you wouldn't believe how fertile it is. Mm -hmm. And then the Anabaptist, I mean, the America fever began, and we just rushed to Pennsylvania. Why do we rush there? Because you can make money there, good money, and you can make it fast. Number three, another reason, uh, watered down reason, widespread leadership failure to transmit the simple values of the Anabaptist vision. Okay, I could just park on this and talk about it for a while. I, I just don't think it's appropriate right now. But any kind of leader, needs to know the theology 
and he needs to know the history and pass it on to his people. If you don't, you're going to pick up some kind of theology someplace. You can't live without theology. And the most dominant theology in this country has been Reformed theology. And so you pick it up mm-hmm. and you start preaching it and not knowing it's not even Anabaptist theology. It's not a New Testament theology. It's a theology, but ideas always have consequences. Number four, loss of Galassian height. This is the most compelling component to the faith that there is. And we did an episode on Galassian Heights, so I don't think I'm going to unpack this further. Yeah, but that's a fascinating thing that, that a lot of people haven't even heard of. Okay, so yeah. why? Yeah. You see, it's something has been dropped along the way, and we need to regain that. Number five, little value placed on faith life stories from the past. Martyr's Mirror ended in 1685. It actually is 1660. And right before they published it, some of the stories from our people in Switzerland started to filter in. And so they put 39 pages at the end of Martyr's Mirror of our story, and then they published it. And it's our people who treasure that book. It's not the Dutch people. It's their story, mostly. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stories there all the way down to 1500. But the martyr stories in there are mostly Dutch martyr stories. They're not ours. But after that was published, it's like, that's it. When I was a boy, there was a book published called Coals of Fire, which had some costly discipleship stories in it. And it impacted me to this day. Those stories were really good, Coals of Fire. And just recently, there's a book published again called Bearing Witness, where there's been another effort to publish some of these stories. These are our stories. They're not anybody else's tradition. It's our tradition. We need more of those. And I say, why? Why was this story thing dropped? Stories have emotional appeal. They're not just about intellect. It's not just about doctrine. We are moved by stories. But why we haven't cl- we've got we've kept something like the Jacob Hostetler story. Everybody knows that. There are a few others, but we've lost too many. I'm sorry. Okay, number six, right along with this, we lost a sense of history. We regained some of that through the efforts of Harold Bender and others. Just bless his heart for all the work he's done in getting us a sense. I don't know if I'd be sitting here today if it wouldn't have been for Harold Bender and his efforts. And the Manila Historical Library is the result of his efforts. And this is because he, he sat down and wrote a lot of this stuff and no. got it printed or, no. or compiled this information? He went to Europe and got a bunch of this German stuff and translated it or brought it to America. Wow. The amount of historical library and archives that are in Indiana, it's an, in, it's an invaluable collection. Hmm. Even to this day, Goshen College is a small college with a huge archives, tremendously valuable. He did his work and he produced the Anabaptist vision as a result of a lot of his work. You're referring to the book, the right? Because, yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure if all our listeners will know, you know, Harold S. Bender wrote a small book called The Anabaptist Vision, yes. which is which is a good good read. It's a little short, yeah. you know, short little book. Yeah. Um, quite interesting. But that's just like a summary of all the stuff that he's been doing. But he wasn't the only one who was doing this. He was just a leader of a whole group of people. I don't know why we have not tapped into more of this. It's like we're too busy making money. We don't do it. So are you suggesting maybe we we get a few more historians oh, among our people? Oh, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> because you find this the history really interesting, right? Yes. Um, and and for someone like myself, I th- well, I mentioned this to you before you um, came down here. I was like, well, Chester, I, I'll do these interviews as best I can, but I'm really weak when it comes to Anabaptist history. I just don't know that much about it. And I wonder if that's, maybe I didn't have access to good books about it or whatever. Well, I don't know if it's just, it's just something I haven't thought about a lot. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I personally think it's the job of high schools oh. to introduce some of these things. If you end at grade eight, there's no really even opportunity. But if you're in high school, the job of a high school history teacher is to introduce so that students can pursue some of it. If you don't even know something is available, how are you ever going to pursue it? And so there's an awful lot of work done for us already. And we just have to pursue some of this stuff. Number seven, we've adopted instead a colorful Protestant theology that's been well packaged and dramatic, it was, it's charismatic, mm-hmm. and it, it grabs people. And we have not done a good job. Mm-hmm. We have dropped something that really gives inner wholeness and joy for something that, that is pretty. Okay, so number eight. As a result of this, we've 
been spiritually ignorant. We have way too much coldness and lethargy. We haven't gotten too much done. I'm embarrassed. I could cry about it, but I just, I'm not going to cry about it. I just do something, but I can. And so number nine, because of this, we worshiped a distant Christ. He's in our theology. He's out there. We go to church and we sing songs to him and we pray to him, but he's not a living, working part of our daily experience. And so we don't have the joy that should be present. And so number, that leads into number 10. We've Anabaptism, especially in this country, has been known for its formalism and its traditionalism, the distant Christ. And this is what many young people have been shown and just do not understand that the living Christ is anything but formal. Tradition has some value to it, but as long as tradition is by itself, it's not a part of the living Christ and the living whole, the healed part. And because it's that way, we've tolerated increasing worldliness, and uh, it's the tired old story of thinking out there it's better than in here, and we have been seduced by that. And of course, then the last one listed here is the loss of the two kingdom concept. And now some of us are thinking that we ought to be involved with the kingdom of this world. We need to vote and get uh, good leaders in power so that we can make the country a Christian. And it's completely opposite of what we originally understood. And I'm embarrassed about it, but we, uh, we just really need to get a hold of this two kingdom concept again and revitalize it. Why has the world consistently resisted this Anabaptist vision? Why have Anabaptist descendants suffered so little? J.B. Phillips wrote this. Just because this is it, real truth, real goodness, real beauty, real God focused in human form, it is not unreasonable to imagine that all the truth-hating and self-loving spiritual powers will join forces against this unwelcome intruder misrepresentation, slander, the dead weight of age-long custom and authority, false propaganda, all these weapons will be used against Jesus Christ and his people, his true people. If he proves, as he must, unrepentant and incorruptible, that's referring to Jesus, he will suffer the full impact of evil. He will probably get imprisoned. He may even get a sentence to death on some fantastic charge referring to Jesus. And I'm reminded of Dostoevsky's story about the Grand Inquisitor meeting Christ. He told Jesus, you made all the wrong answers to those questions. We're going to have to kill you all over again because we can't afford to have you around. And that is the living legacy that's come down to us today. If we are going to identify with the living Christ like that, we cannot be tolerated in the world either. We are too threatening to the system. And that is why, at least initially, the Anabaptists were persecuted so heavily, correct? And you're saying a lot of that has shifted and maybe scattered a bit, and it's just not that way anymore. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. Um, I feel like we've set the stage for a number of things, and now it's almost like we should go off and do a whole series on Anabaptist history because it feels like there's so much of this story that... Um, like that I need to understand that our that our people should understand not not to glorify the past. No, you know, we're not, not trying to do that, but knowing how where things came from and how things have moved through time That's true. is 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 important. Of course um, it is. I don't think I fully appreciated history uh, nearly enough uh, back in the day and I am sure I, well, I probably for still young don't like, too, but but it but it does matter, you know, and matter. and um this is this is inspiring me to to read up a bit on my church history, you know, and, and try to understand these things better. We have gold in our hands in our history that is invaluable. We don't realize how valuable what we have is. Mm -hmm. And many of us are willing to take these coins and go and flip them like this and watch them glint in the sun and hear it go plop and chuckle about it and have no idea what we're doing. Because we don't understand fully why how you, valuable it is. Why do you flip out gold coins? <laughs> to hear them go plop and to watch them glisten in the sun. That's dumb, really dumb. But is it because we don't understand the value 
and because it, over over the years it can get slowly lost, and then you don't you don't know what you're missing. Exactly. I, I feel like I don't really know what I'm missing necessarily. You, you know what I mean? Ninety percent uh, of the solution to a problem is to recognize that there isn't a pro- there is a problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, this is um, it's a lot to think about, and I I hope this inspires our listeners and, and viewers to read up on church history to learn the story, Amen. and Amen. and Amen. because of that can help guide their lives of where they should go next. That's right. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We invite you to join our monthly partner program. Monthly partners are key to the financial sustainability of Anabaptist perspectives. Partners also gain access to bonus content, including our exclusive podcast where we respond to audience questions and comments. Sign up at anabaptistperspectives.org.